Hun blev jo en Thanos en Disla. Det er det. Emo sen, jeg lukker emo sen round og sen divoy. Mig by katim na opim na wukim ul lo Disla. Kom op i emo sen kanu. Kanu. Kan So this is the surgical side and when the new building is built there'll be like another 25 beds going out this way because um, you can see this is pretty full. A lot of this is trauma, this boy's gunshot, uh, this lady's got a broken leg, she was nearly had her foot chopped off completely. Uh, he got chopped in the arm and ruptured a number of tendons. It's unimaginable, it's unimaginable. Yeah, so I mean, Kompiem is up in the north of Anger, sort of on the border with Medang province and East Sepik. That's been our home for 22 years now. All our kids have grown up there and and where we've lived. This is our eldest daughter and second eldest and Nicholas you've met already. Yeah, that's where I cut my teeth as a rural doctor. There was really nothing there. Um, there was two buildings, there was one house, no x-ray or no laboratory or nothing. So yeah, when, the, when we first came in, in 19, 90, uh, 1999, this was the administration, the whole administration was in here. And this is the operating theater, which I'll show you in a minute. There's a dispensary and then there's outpatients. So this was the old operating theater. Actually, it was also the place where they did the sterilizing. When I first came, there was a wall just here. We had to, these were our operating lights. We used to, at the beginning, there was a single light that used to hang from the ceiling, a, a light bulb. And it would sit right next to my head when I did the operating. And then I put these ones in, these four for the belly and the chest, and these four for each arm, because we did a lot of surgery on the arms because of the machete wounds. And uh, yeah, we used this for the first 20 years. We had no understanding of this at all. All we knew was that our hospital wasn't very good and that we had to make it better. We didn't have any idea about how to go about you know, building a hospital. You have to have a plan, not a plan for tomorrow, but sort of for the long term, so a master plan so that you can work towards that over the next 20 or 30 years so that when you build a building, you then don't 10 years later realize you've got to knock it down to make way for a different building. People need to recognize, you know, a, a country has to uh, live within its means. Although Papua New Guinea is a high growth economy, at the end of the day, the government has about five 5.4, 5.5 billion dollars to spend in running the country. So in real terms, uh, PNG does not have a lot of money to spend out of its budget for education or for health. 
That's why the NGO sector, Dr. Mills in the Highlands, is just so important. In some ways, he is the model of community health care because he, he went to the Highlands, then he gradually expanded on the range of services. Now it is a fully fledged hospital as such. And he, he runs that and he's the main health care provider. Put in a big last day. <laughs> so every morning starts like this, you know, coming around, getting the guys busy, because when you've got a big crew, you know, you want to make sure that everyone has got a job to do and that they know what they're doing and whatever. So. And then I meet with the doctors and find out what's going on there and the day goes on from there. First, first time I start, I'm not got any kind of maintenance, Louis. And then um, this man has been walk when I'm some little missionary long Western Islands. Blah be poor. So I'm been retired and I go stop the house blowing the upside and then me play go sit down second. And then he was the first. So that was 22 years ago, yes. I think. Yes. Then behind, I'm me play selecting boys blow one one tribe, Louis. So I'm blow one blood tribe, I'm blow another tribe, I'm blow another tribe. And then um, maybe like one black white man being come. Culture is really important when you're providing a health service. If you don't understand the cultural differences, you're not going to make much progress. Engans are not known for being backward. You know, they're pretty forceful. They're very forthright in what they speak and their wishes. They will. So if you upset someone, you're going to find out about it in a big way, and they can shut you down very, very easily. Oh, um, um. I've been giving you um, blow you blow long, walking list blow you blow long, how much tools stuff, you know, blow me long, maintaining all this like list, man, oh, I'm blow you blow. Why are you putting this like me? But it's me presenting, now me presenting, come blow you, and you get savvy, how much me blow you? One of the problems that expatriates get into in this country is that because Melanesian culture is so polite and so respectful, and so you get a lot of deferential talk and white people think that every idea they have, everyone's agreeing with it and it's excellent. These guys, they need to be directed as to what needs But secretly, you know, Melanesians are saying to themselves, you know, whatever, but they don't express that. Story long, girlfriend long, all long, one of me and I am. Okay, finish. Yep, thanks. Nadla doctor must come looking well now morning, I think. Nadla boy, Mangi doctor. Then get a battery went out and we check him again. All you pull in, assembly you may give him to her. Yeah, I just sort of good me disturb him. So Monday I'm going to Dr. Diana. Wednesday, blah, 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 Friday, but Dr. Mesh. Yeah. You must come, you must For the last six years that I've been here in Compiam, I didn't have um, that great of an understanding about what life in Compiam would be like, um, somewhere rural and remote, because I'd been brought up in the city, obviously. So Compiam was probably the first rural exposure and, um, that I had in my life as a doctor and probably just in general. That we put on them, but they're not. In my journey in Compiam, I've come to realize that being a doctor is really about serving. I think even if I were to transition back into an urban setting, I'd still be serving my people rather than uh, practicing medicine. No? Yes? Apple? Apple does not say apple because... Apple. What? Because? Yes? If you're going to keep staff in a hospital, in a remote place, you have to educate their kids because there's no education, you know. I mean, you look at Dr. Rebecca, she's got a young girl. 
she doesn't want to just send her to any school that's not functioning well. She wants her to get properly educated. When can it say its second sound? And when can it not? So, I may say its second So that's sound. a real part of the puzzle. And we realised that for our own family because we had our own kids. And that Karina started her journey here just homeschooling. But then that helps us, but it doesn't help anyone else. So this has really come out of that journey and it's become an enormously important part. I, you know, almost I would go as far as saying I don't think the hospital would continue if it wasn't for this. Come on, camera crew's here. I remember when the, when the, the school numbers were only small, even that was a challenge and I couldn't even imagine having a school of 50 kids. But now we have uh, yeah, uh, we had over 50 at the beginning of this year. Um, we did have some tribal fighting during the year, which unfortunately saw some of our students um, disappear. So our numbers went down a bit. So we did have 10 students just at the beginning of the year for kindy, but we've um, no, only got five now. Our birthing rates are chronically low, very low. One of the reasons is that when they come here, the women often don't have anything for the babies. They don't have any nappies or anything. But then also we found out that there was a traditional belief that if they buy anything for the baby before it's born, that actually makes it more likely that the baby won't survive. Sometimes there is some resistance because there's fear um, of the unknown. And like you said, if they have like maybe a, lots of kids at home that they need to take care of, um, they may be probably less inclined to come. She was sitting on the edge of the bed and she had severe heart failure. And then I said, okay, where are you from? And she says, well, I'm from such and such a place. Well, that place, I've, it's on the back of the mountains. I've walked to this place, it's really a hard walk. I'm looking at her so short of breath and then I'm thinking about this walk and I'm thinking, how did you do that? Like, how did you, how did you come here? And then she didn't say anything for a bit and then she just said, slowly. You know, and, I, and I, it's never left me, you know, that, that statement, because in a sense, that's, you know, when you're asking, how did you do all this? Well, that's the answer. You, you do it slowly. There is a sense that doctors are starting to get into this. It's still very early, but medical students are talking about it. People are getting on social media and actually coming together and doctors are actually going out into these places. It must now some of years, I think. One of a year. This is a pretty standard house for most rural Angans. So there'll be a fire in the middle like this, with the, something burning or the, the ashes there. There's no usually a fence around it. So one of the things we see quite commonly is children that fall into the ashes. They get burnt on the hand. That's really common. But there's no chimney. The smoke rises to the top and slowly comes out through the grass. And as the lung tissue gets destroyed, it gets hard for the blood to go from one side to the other. So the heart eventually fails. Children under one year of age, the most common cause of death would be pneumonia of some kind. Joe was um, involved in a fight between two clans and he was shot in the back and he's been a paraplegic ever since that time. Bullet them kiss him you don't want him up straight. Oh yes, 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 yes. 
So we don't have a wheelchair for him. And even if we had a wheelchair, it's pretty hard on this terrain for a wheelchair to go anywhere. So he stays in the house. He has a catheter to drain the urine. But yeah, there's no services for paraplegic people in this part of the world. So it's, it's a difficult life. Mm -hmm. Can I have the torch? Set? <laughs> the, sorry, knee, bend him leg, leg, leg. Thank you. I come from Australia, right? So, you know, Australia's the big outback and, and it's known for, you know, being remote and, and a big country. But in truth, Australia has 15% of people living in the rural places and 85% live in the city. In PNG, it's the complete opposite. So 85% of people live in rural areas and 15% live in town. So, you know, you would think, okay, well, that means that 85% of the resources and the doctors and the nurses will be, you know, and it, it's just not even close to that, not even close. Okay, that's good. Yeah. You know, putting it bluntly and short, for the vast majority of Papua New Guineans, healthcare is, um, it's an imagination, really. Um, they make do as best they can. Um, they occasionally may bump into medicines or some stuff person that will help them, but they just suffer on their own. Nowadays when I have medical students uh, come to me, I force them to walk up and down these mountains and they just say this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And I say to them that's, you know, I'm hurting you and I actually intended to hurt you. Um, because each step you're taking and gasping for breath going up this mountain, you have to understand that there's a pregnant woman who has to do that or someone who's sick with fever or maybe they've got a broken arm and they're in pain. And Imagine them doing that. Coming up in the next episode of Leave No One Behind. When we first arrived, um, there hadn't there was a local aid post, but there wasn't anybody working in the local aid post, and there hadn't been for about 15 years. Suppose you like change me go adopted parents, you must go to Engoram one time. True Papa, not adopted Papa. In the last two years, we've treated over 5,000 patients a year at a clinic with only three medical staff. European healthcare providers could learn from some of the NGOs here in Papua New Guinea on how to take meager resources and create an incredible service to the local communities that they, they look after. Mm -hmm.